Bob Hayward, Director of the Petite Institute. I'd like to welcome everyone this morning to the 2011 Distinguished Lecture. My honor and privilege to introduce the Director of the National Science Foundation, Dr. Super Suresh, as the 2011 Petite Institute Distinguished Lecture. It's a great pleasure to welcome him back to the Tech since he was just here to give our commencement speech in the spring for our graduating PhD students. Dr. Suresh is the former Dean of Engineering at MIT. As you all know, he was nominated by President Obama to be the director of the National Science Foundation and sworn in as the 13th director of the NSF in October 2010 for a six-year term. He oversees NSF's $7 billion budget dedicated to advancing fundamental science and engineering research and education in the United States, including, as we discussed this morning, an emphasis on promoting the training of the next generation of scientists and engineers. Dr. Suresh received his bachelor's degree from the Indian Institute of Technology, a master's degree from Iowa State, and his doctorate from MIT. Over the past 30 years, he's applied an interdisciplinary background and interest in mechanics, material science, and biology to better understand changes in the biomechanics of cells associated with diseases such as malaria, uh, and also has done pioneering work on the development of engineered and biological materials using multi-scale experimental and computational techniques. As you might expect, Dr. Suresh's contributions have been recognized by numerous awards. The Padma Sri Award from the President of India, the Indian Science Congress General President's Award, the European Materials Medal, which, uh, as I understand, he's the only recipient of that award outside of Europe, are just a few of the many prestigious awards Suresh has received for his innovative research and commitment to improving engineering education around the world. Technology Review Magazine highlighted his work on nanobiomechanics as one of the top 10 emerging technologies that will have a significant impact on business, medicine, or culture. In recognition of these contributions, Dr. Suresh has been elected a fellow or honorary fellow of all of the major material societies in the United States and India. He's been elected to the Spanish Royal Academy of Sciences the German National Academy of Sciences, the Academy of Sciences of the Developing World, the Indian National Academy of Engineering, and the Indian Academy of Sciences, and of course, the US National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Super Suresh as the 2011 Petit Institute Distinguished Lecturer. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Goldberg. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Professor Bob Naram for inviting me to give this lecture. Uh, I have a lot of friends and colleagues at Georgia Tech. Um, I have written papers with people from Georgia Tech. I first visited here in 1983, and I've visited uh, a number of times since then. So it's a real, real delight uh, to be back, back here. Um, this particular lecture, uh, Professor Naram invited me to deliver before I officially joined NSF. And uh, I, uh, so the flavor of the lecture, it will not mention NSF. This is not an NSF lecture, it's more of a technical lecture. And um, uh, if there are questions on NSF, I would be very happy to discuss it uh, 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 during the lunch time. So I'm going to focus primarily on the technical side of, uh, uh, of so that in keeping with the tradition of the petite lectures. Um, this is a topic that, uh, is the microphone uh, working well? Maybe I should stand in one place and, is that better? Okay. Okay. Um, the topic that I'm going to discuss is something that I've been pursuing for about 10 years. This is a topic that's not new to most of you. Um, this is a topic that's been uh, the subject of many of your investigations. Just to put things in context, bringing engineering, life sciences, and medicine into a common um, focus of investigation has been going on for a long time. In the 60s and 70s, 
things like uh, pumping of the human heart, the fluid mechanics of blood flow through arteries and veins, uh, the orthopedics, uh, articulating surfaces, uh, biomechanics of implants, the material science of implants, the biocompatibility. These are tissue engineering. These have been around for a long time. At the time we started this work, the new and exciting things for us were the following. There were revolutions going on in many, many different disciplines. You take genetics and genomics, the revolution that started and uh, that led to the Human Genome Project that has so much to inform engineering in new and unique ways. The revolution in nanoscience and nanotechnology that, uh, that has been going on for some time, but that culminated in the creation of the National Nanotechnology Initiative in 1999, also added significant new opportunities. With respect to the nanotechnology, now we are at a point where we can buy a commercial instrument, a desktop instrument, that can routinely measure piconewton level forces and nanometer level displacements. So we can study, we can link that force displacement relationship, which is what mechanical engineers typically study. We can link that to biological processes for a single DNA, for example. We can genetically manipulate a single molecule and ask the question, what is the effect of the single molecule on human disease state? We can link it to biochemistry, we can link it to diagnostics, therapeutics, drug efficacy, and so forth. Along with these revolutions, we also had another revolution in computer hardware and software. So it may be easy to measure pico-newton level forces. What does it mean? And how do we interpret it? Oftentimes we need computational tools to guide experiments, to interpret experiments, and to design experiments. And that revolution has also been taking place in the last 10 to 15 years. So when you put all of this together, you have a unique opportunity at the intersections of many different disciplines to take on a set of problems and try to understand them and go from the molecular level to the organ level, a system level. And this is exactly what we try to do. This was our aspiration about 10 years ago. So with that broad introduction, let me go to what motivated our work specifically. And we wanted to ask a simple question, but a fairly broad question that covers a wide variety of human diseases. So we wanted to study human diseases. We wanted to study them primarily at the cell and molecular level, but take them up to the organ level. So the first question was, pick your favorite disease, uh, whether it's uh, infectious disease, a cancer, or some kind of a hereditary disease, um, can we make these connections? Can we ask, answer this question? How are human disease states influenced by changes in, in cell and molecular level physical properties? How do we track it systematically from a completely healthy state to a fully pathological state at the cell and molecular level? It's not an easy question to answer. And vice versa, how do changes in cell, physical, and molecular properties influence disease states? Second, how do we start at the single cell level so we can do things not only systematically but quantitatively as engineers and physicists would do? It's often very difficult to do quantitatively in biology given the complexity of the problem. And how do we quantify this? How do we model this at the single cell level then at the cell population level by bringing tools from a variety of fields from biology, physics, biochemistry, genetics, and so forth? in the context of human diseases. Third, how do we scale it up, scale up our understanding, our investigation from the molecule level to the organ level by employing computational tools. Again, these are multi-scale computational tools. Some will involve molecular level, some will involve continuum level, some in between, and how do we bring that in? So we decided after about two years of searching, we, for a particular reason, we decided to choose three classes of diseases. In the infectious disease, we chose malaria. We chose malaria for a variety of reasons. First of all, every year about 450 million people are exposed to some form of malaria. The two most lethal forms of malaria are Plasmodium falciparum, which kills most of the people. A relatively less lethal is Plasmodium vivax. 
It affects roughly 7% of the world population every year, and approximately 1 to 3 million people die from malaria every year. So it's a significant uh, human challenge to address this from a societal level. But equally importantly, at the scientific level, malaria happens in the human body involving red blood cells. And it, you can go from a completely healthy state of a, at the cell level to a completely pathological state in 48 hours. And you can culture that in vitro. So that gives you an enormous power to do in vitro experiments, which we can then translate to in vivo experiments in, in animal models and potentially take it to um, societal implications and human malaria. And that was one of the motivations in choosing Plasmodium falciparum malaria. So once we started to study red blood cells, immediately we could look at uh, other types of uh, blood cell disorders like hereditary blood cell disorders, like sickle cell anemia, uh, spherocytosis, elliptocytosis, and so forth. And then the kinds of work that we started to do naturally led us to also investigate uh, different types of cancer. I won't go into the details of this, just to get some depth into the talk rather than talking in vague generalities. I'm going to focus on tools and techniques most of the time in the first topic, say a little bit about the second topic, and then conclude with one particular example for a case of cancer, and hopefully that will convey uh, how we have uh, addressed the issue with respect to these various questions. So let me first start with single cell, the simplest level analysis, single cell mechanics involving going from a perfectly healthy state to a, com to a completely pathological state of, with, with one cell. So again, I'm going to start with uh, Plasmodium falciparum malaria, and it involves human red blood cells. So before I come to the disease part of it, let me start with the carrier of malaria in the human body, which is the human red blood cell. So most of you know this very well. For the benefit of those who may not have the background, I'm going to go to uh, freshman biology just for one slide and just to refresh your memory. And this, the human blood cell, human red blood cell is a beautiful, beautiful machine which has a biconcave or a discocyte shape. Its long diameter is about 8 microns. Its shorter diameter is about 2 microns. And here is a picture of a healthy red blood cell from Bruce Albert's textbook. It has no nucleus, which makes it easier. And its main function in the body is to take oxygen to distant corners of the body and take carbon dioxide back to the, to the lungs. And every second, our bone marrow produces hundreds of thousands of red blood cells. 42% of the volume of blood is red blood cells. That's why the color of blood is red. 30 to 50% 30 range. Transports oxygen and carbon dioxide. And this is the typical, typical shape of the red blood cell. Without knowing anything about biology or anything about engineering, we can immediately make a connection between disease, human disease, and mechanical engineering, and just with this one picture. And here is the reason for it. The long diameter of the red blood cell is 8 micrometers. The smallest inner opening of a blood vessel in our brain is 2 to 3 micrometers. So an 8 micron, um, can call it a balloon with hemoglobin and um, has to squeeze through a two, mi two to three micron tube, flexible tube. That means it has to undergo large reversible elastic deformation. And it has to do that thousands and thousands of times during the course of 120 day life of the red blood cell in the human body. So this is what we call, mechanical engineers call rubber elasticity a neo response, fully reversible elastic response that's nonlinear. And when the cell loses its ability to deform in a manner that's reversible, we get a disease. If it's because of a foreign object, a parasite, a vector, we call it malaria. If it's because of a single mutation in the, in the genetic uh, makeup, we, we, it may be a sickle cell disease or a spherocytosis, or it could be something else. So that's the connection that we want to probe. 
and we have new tools that have come into existence in the last five, five to ten years. That's what we want to take, uh, make use of. Now, this is what an engineer thinks. Let's see what the parasitologists think. So, this is a picture taken from a paper published in Nature in 2002 by Lou Miller at NIH. And this is a summary of the pathogenic basis for human plasmodium falciparum malaria. The carrier of malaria is the mosquito, the female Anopheles mosquitoes, when they are pregnant, they need protein to nurture the eggs, so they feed on human blood. If the person being bitten has the gametes for malaria, it gets to the gut of the mosquito, gets processed. When the mosquito feeds again on the human skin, um, she injects something called sporocytes, tiny particles that go to the human liver. The liver takes about a week or so to process it and sends one micron sized particles with a sharp tip called apical prominence to the bloodstream and it gets to the bloodstream. And that is the beginning of the 48 hour cycle of malaria in the human body, it is called the asexual cycle of malaria. Three things happen during the course of 48 hours. So, a one micron little parasite or a merozoite targets a human red blood cell which is about 8 micrometers by 7, 2 micrometers disc shape. It pokes into the red blood cell, gets inside, the cell seals itself. It is a beautiful mechanical penetration problem that has not been sorted out yet. And no fluid leaks out in the process no hemoglobin leaks out. Once the parasite gets inside the red blood cell, it is in a cocoon, it is protected from the immune system of the body. Three things happen during the course of 48 hours. Proteins get transported from the parasite to the cytos cytosol of the red blood cell, then to the spectral network which is the cytoskeleton of the red blood cell and then it affects the membrane properties as well. Within 48 hours, the deformability of the red blood cell changes significantly. So, the cell becomes very stiff. In the second half of the 48 hour cycle, because of the proteins that are transported, nanoscale knobs form on the outer surface of the red blood cell. They, they are tethering sites, they increase the cytoadherence of the cells to other cells, other red blood cells infected or uninfected. They also increase the cytoadherence to the endothelial cells. And this causes increased adhesion and both increased, deform, increased uh, uh, stiffness or reduced deformability and increased cytoadherence makes it more difficult for the cell to move through the body. On top of it, a single parasite undergoes nuclear division and multiplies up to 32 parasites during the course of 48 hours. At the end of 48 hours, the cell is very stiff, it is very sticky and it ruptures. It spills out all the parasites into the bloodstream and they go now invade new red blood cells and this cycle continues. You may know that when somebody gets malaria, they have a 48 hour fever cycle. That coincides with the release of the parasites to the bloodstream. So, there is a connection between this mechanical phenomenon and the body's response in raising the temperature. So, what is new in the last 10 years is historically for the last 30 years, people have studied red blood cell deformability using traditional tools such as micropipette aspiration and so forth. When we started this work in the literature, it was felt that the extent of stiffening was a few times compared to the healthy state. But the new tools give us new information that I will show in the next slide. So, we used a technique called optical tweezers or laser tweezers, where we have two high refractive index beads that are attached to a red blood cell and we use the beads as handles just like a mechanical engineer would do an experiment in a mechanical testing machine, except that we can control the force to a resolution of one pico newton. And we can do that at the pico scale force, micrometer scale resolution using a optical microscope and a high speed camera. And I do not want to go into the calibration techniques and all of this, uh, they are all in the published literature since our publication. But the main message I want to give is that with this level of flexibility, we can do experiments in a systematic and controlled manner, much more so than what traditional 
biological engineering techniques would allow us. So as a result of this, when you go through these experiments, you can control the force so precisely. So here are examples of a healthy red blood cell. The healthy red blood cell, um, I will look this way but point this way. <laughs> So the healthy red blood cell is the top row. The first picture on your left is zero force. The middle top picture is a constant force of 68 piconewtons. The right picture is 150 piconewtons. You can see the ability of the cell to stretch. The bottom row shows the same experiment at the same force, but now with a parasite inside that you can see. The cell loses its ability to deform when there is a parasite inside. This is after 36 hours in the lab. So until this work, which was published in 2004, it was felt that the extent of stiffening was a, was a few times. When you employ the right tools on the entire range of 48-hour uh, cycle, the early ring stage, the trophoid stage, and the Shizan stage, you can show it's not a factor of a few times. It's more like a factor of up to 100. And that makes a huge difference, even if you don't understand malaria. Malaria patients get certain drugs to improve blood flow and one of the drugs they receive is called pentaxifeline which is also given to stroke patients and that drug is being given to increase blood flow to avoid, to, to counteract the increased stiffness and the increased stickiness of the red blood cells and uh, it makes a huge difference on how much dosage you give depending on whether it's few times or a hundred times. So that's what uh, physics informs us with respect to a disease. So even though the stiffening was not something new that has been known for 20 years in the parasitology community, what has been new is the extent of it. So now we can, staying with the intersection of physics and parasitology, in this case malaria, let's look at one other problem. First again starting with a healthy cell, then going to an infected cell. It's been known for about a hundred years that all living cells flicker or fluctuate. They fluctuate and they fluctuate with a spatial uh, displacement of nanometers or tens of nanometers. They flicker with a temporal resolution of a millisecond. So here is an engineering or a physics challenge. You take a live cell, to keep it alive, you have to have it in a, phospho, in a, in a PBS solution. And you have to have a non-contact experiment that doesn't destroy the cell. You have to measure vibrations to a resolution of tens of nanometers and displacements to a resolution of a, 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 a temporal resolution of a millisecond. And you have to do it whole, full field. You have to do it to the entire cell which is micrometer scale. So understandably, nobody has been able to do that experiment full field, even though groups in Munich, groups at the New York Blood Center have been able to do it either in the center or around the edges. When you do those experiments, you find that what you measure at the edges is very different from what you measure in the center. So there have been conflicting reports in the literature. In one case, it says that if you modulate ATP, there is no effect on red blood cell flickering. Another equally reputable group says if you modulate ATP, it has a huge effect on red blood cell flickering. So who do you believe? So we decided that the only way to answer this is to measure red blood cell membrane flickering, whole, whole cell, and comes to the rescue um, our uh, physics department. So here is a ex very simple experiment that I will describe. And I've been told that before lunch, I can show an equation. But after lunch, I cannot show an equation, <laughs> even though it's a bioengineering department. So because it's before lunch, that's my equation for the talk. Um, so here is the very simple technique. We have a live human red blood cell. We send a planar wave of certain known wavelength, a laser beam. Because of the difference in refractive index between the inside and outside of the red blood cell, there is a phase shift. That phase shift can be captured digitally, so that's delta phi here. Once we know the phase shift, once we know the wavelength of the light that comes through, and 
once we know the difference in refractive index between inside and outside, we can calculate the height of the cell to a resolution of a nanometer with a temporal resolution of a millisecond. Full field. Problem solved. So our spectroscopy lab at MIT, which has been involved in this for 75 years, with, in collaboration with them, we decided to apply this to human diseases in collaboration with my late colleague, uh, uh, Professor Michael Feld. And this is the thesis of one of his students and one of my students together, which came out a couple of years ago. And so once we have this, we have a very powerful non-contact tool. From the fluctuation itself, we can tell whether it's a disease state or a healthy state at the cell level, non-contact, nanoscale resolution. It can apply for any cell. Here it's for a human cell. First healthy and then with malaria. So here is the video clip of how that works. First a healthy red blood cell. So you can see the uniform flickering and that's the time step in milliseconds. Then the early stage after about seven hours of being the parasite in there, it's still relatively uniform but slightly non-uniform here. After about 36 hours, you'll see in this Shizon stage, you can see it's highly non-uniform. The cell is very stiff, the parasite is over there and you can correlate between flickering and stiffness. And this readily gives you, gives you a quantitative signature that's non-contact. So my former student, Paul Park, who is now a professor at KAIST in Korea, he's applying this technique to now to look at other diseases, including uh, sickle cell anemia, and, uh, spherocytosis, and her other hereditary blood disorders. Not only this, now we can link it to biochemistry. So what we did was we intentionally added ATP or depleted ATP. And we can deplete ATP either metabolically or irreversibly. And we can monitor the membrane displacement. And when we do that compared to the healthy state, and we can do that in a reversible manner in this case, you see a very strong signature. If you measure the p-values, it's a very statistically significant result. And when you take this information, you can clearly demonstrate that the two groups from Munich and New York who said, that at the edge it doesn't matter, in the center it matters. They're both right. And one was looking only at the edge, one was looking at the center. If you do the whole field, both, both are right and you solve the problem. Not only can you solve the problem, you can link it to molecular structure. For example, you see these peaks at periodic intervals. And the peaks are each associated with the way the spectrum network is tethered to the phospholipid bilayer through proteins, specific proteins. When the protein connection is, is um, made null and void, you begin to see these fluctuations. So how ATP affects the tethering of the spectral network to the phospholipid bilayer makes a huge difference. So now you can go from the physics experiment to the role of ATP, to biochemistry, to the specific molecular structure and the processes that take place systematically and quantitatively. So now, this is physics or chemistry and mechanics. Now let's talk about genetics and mechanics. So in the, the, as you know well, uh, the genetic revolution really took full, uh, full force in the early part of 2000 to 2005. Around 2003, 2004, the entire genetic code of the Plasmodium falciparum parasite was figured out. And just purely serendipitously, I was doing a sabbatical at Institute Pasteur in Paris. And at that time, there was a PhD student there in Paris called Monica Diaz Silva. And her PhD thesis was to try to genetically clone a particular parasite, a Plasmodium falciparum parasite, which based on Institute Pasteur's field work in different parts of the world where malaria is prevalent, indicated that that one particular protein was responsible for change in deformability. But it was only a hypothesis based on field work with mosquitoes and, and in, in the jungles of Africa. So we decided to combine the, the work that she had done as part of her PhD thesis with the work my group was doing at that time and try to see if we can make a direct connection between one molecule by genetically modulating the Plasmodium falciparum parasite 
and doing the single cell biomechanical experiment with a pico-newton level force. So here is the experiment. Let me just describe a triple immunofluorescent optical micrograph. So the protein is called RISA, which is described here. They suspected RISA stands for ring-infected erythrocyte surface antigen. And Institute Pasteur work revealed that maybe RISA was a culprit in causing increased deformability in the early stage of the asexual cycle of malaria in the human body. So how do we prove it? And we took a very circuitous route. So Institute Pasteur in Paris, so this is an interdisciplinary institute. Uh, I thought you will enjoy this uh, story. Uh, institute Pasteur does the genetic cloning in Paris. They do knockout of this RISA protein. They can not only knock it out, they can knock it back in, which gives us a very nice control experiment. They ship it to the School of Public Health at Harvard because they have more experience than my lab in handling particular parasite. And in the School of Public Health, it's cultured. Then it's appropriately transported to my lab at MIT. And there, it, uh, uh, the in vitro experiments are done uh, using optical tweezers. And that's how these experiments are done. So in the top right figure here, you have three colors. If the cell had a all red blood cells have a protein called band 3. Whenever there is band 3, it lights up as color red in the microscope. The parasite is either blue or purple. So you can see a parasite here, 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 and so forth. So when you see the parasite by giving it a particular color code, the parasite has the RISA protein. So it transports the RISA protein to the host red blood cell. When the cell receives it, RISA protein is color coded green. So the receiving cell turns green. So this is the wild type. And the wild type, you can see there is RISA protein. We knock out the RISA protein, do the same experiment. There is no green here. All this proves is we have successfully knocked out the RISA protein. Now we do these experiments. So here is the result of the experiments on stiffness as a function of uh, normal physiological temperature. This is the healthy cell. This is the wild type. Now, if you knock out the RISA protein, the stiffness drops. Okay. So, in fact, if you do large numbers of experiments, you find the knockout is just about the same as the wild type, as the healthy cell, and the wild type is much stiffer. Now, if you do the experiment under high febrile conditions, which is maximum temperature of 41 degrees Celsius, we know whenever the, there is a parasite, the body temperature goes up, it becomes even stiffer. Why does it do that? Because when the parasite gets inside the body and that affects the red blood cell, the body fights it by raising the temperature. So the body is clever, but the parasite is even cleverer. So the parasite stabilizes the spectral network and it stiffens in response to that. When you knock out the RISA protein, you not only suppress the increase in stiffness, you completely suppress the temperature dependence. So this you could not have figured out unless you do the experiments of the kind that we did involving sophisticated instruments like optical tweezers or uh, genetic manipulation combined with mechanical engineering experiments. So this now, we are not there, but this points to one possible route. If you want to target deformability as a way uh, to avoid at least one of the pathogenic bases of malaria, you have two choices can kill the RISA protein in the mosquito before it gets to the human body, or you have a drug to target that's given to, to the humans. So this is, a, uh, this is one way. I mean, nobody has figured it out. We have no clue at this point. But this is, this is one possible avenue that people can look into. So, so far I talked about single cells and static experiments. So naturally we can ask the question, what does it mean for real life, real experiments where cells move through the body and there are so many other interactions. So we can go to the next step of a dynamic experiment. So I mentioned earlier at the beginning that the smallest blood vessel in our brain is two to three microns inside diameter. No live imaging technique will tell us how the red blood cell goes through a, 
a, a small blood vessel in the brain with or without malaria, MRI just wouldn't do it. There is no other technique that can give in vivo information. So we try in vitro experiment here to demonstrate, first I'm going to show you for a healthy cell. This is made of um, a microfluidic channel made of PDMS polymer. And this diameter, this cross section is the equivalent diameter of three micrometers, which is roughly the diameter of a blood vessel in the brain. So what you're going to see is uh, red blood, healthy red blood cells going through here. And you can see how they deform dynamically compared to the static experiment that I showed you. So this is the work of my former PhD student, Dave Quinn. So you can see the incredible ability of the cell to deform. And also it takes back its shape. There are some beautiful things that engineers can do with it. From the time lag it takes to recover its shape, you can use a linear viscoelastic model and you can calculate a character, characteristic relaxation time. You can calculate the viscosity of the membrane and all kinds of things. You can get pressure versus velocity measurements and so forth. The fluid mechanicians can have a, have a field day with these kinds of experiments. That's for a healthy cell. I showed you using a static experiment that when there is a malaria parasite inside the cell, it makes the cell stiff and therefore the cell may not be able to go through a blood vessel in the brain. How do I demonstrate it in vitro? So here is an experiment, a cocktail glass experiment. So here we have again a PDMS channel. The PDMS channel is in the form of an hourglass, a cocktail glass, and it has a stem whose cross-sectional diameter, equivalent diameter is about two micrometers. At the mouth of this, uh, the entry point here, this cell has a malaria parasite here, and this, the next cell has a malaria parasite here. All the other cells are healthy cells. They don't have a parasite in them. Based on my static experiment, my hypothesis is that this cell will lose its ability to squeeze through this channel. So will this cell, but all the other cells will be able to go through. So is that true? So let me demonstrate that using this experiment. So these two are stuck at the mouth of the channel. You can see what happens now. So the red blood cell has incredible ability to squeeze through small openings. But instead of two cells infected with a, invaded by a parasite, if we have 20 cells blocking the entryway, then blood may not get through. The tissue here may not get oxygen surrounding this blood vessel. So that's the point. And here is a demonstration of that at the cell, cell level using latest engineering tools. Now we can go further. So being an engineer, we can ask the question, what can I do to diagnose malaria? Right now, the most common technique, especially because it affects developing countries uh, in remote areas, the most common technique is to take a blood smear from a suspected patient, do a blood smear, put it in a microscope. Usually a relatively a poorly trained technician sits in front of an optical microscope and clicks the number of infected cells. How many red blood cells are there in the body? And 2% parasitemia can be enough to kill a patient. So it's, a, it's not a science, it's more of an art. With all the microfluidic tools, can we do something better? For example, someday can we have a portable, disposable, inexpensive uh, tool about the size of our thumbnail, where you take whole blood, put a drop of blood and ask the question, does somebody have malaria? Do they have plasmodium falciparum malaria? Do they have plasmodium vivax malaria? If so, can we diagnose it? Can we do something like what is usually done for patients whose kidneys are not working? Can you channel blood from the body, run it through a machine that takes out the infected cells one way? leaves the uninfected cells that are purified and sent back to the body. All kinds of things. Uh, these are pie in the sky thinking at this point. But we've demonstrated, and I'll show with this figure, we have several patterns on this, that you can actually use the mechanical signature as a way to diagnose whether a cell is infected or not. Not only that, you can, you can take two healthy cells, a young red blood cell called reticulocyte, which is just two days old after being released from the bone marrow versus a more mature cell, we can distinguish them using these devices. So here is an example of a healthy cell versus a parasite invaded cell. We create obstacle courses of different geometries, and these are little microfluidic devices that are, that are portable. 
from the speed with which they move, we can not only tell whether it's infected or uninfected, we can tell whether it's a ring stage, trophoid stage or schizon stage. We can tell whether it's plasmodium falciparum or plasmodium vivax. We can also tell whether it's a reticulocyte or a more mature cell. With a whole blood, a drop of blood, we can do this right now. So this is something that Professor Jay Hahn in our electrical engineering department at MIT and I have been working on in collaboration with uh, several colleagues from around the world, including a group in Singapore. Now the biochemists and biologists have traditionally used conventional biology techniques to separate, uh, using RNA techniques and so forth, to separate uh, young red blood cells from more mature cells. So we actually, in order to do that the traditional way, we, we buy blood from the blood bank in Boston after it's tested for HIV and all this, we take it to the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, use their facilities to get reticulocytes. We decided, can we identify without going through the biology rigmarole, can we do it the engineering rigmarole to do this? And here is a demonstration of how we can do that. So reticulocytes are released from the young red blood cells, released from the bone marrow, less than typically two days old, versus any other older red blood cell. Again, we have these channels. And we send all blood, all red blood cells through them. From the speed with which they move through, we can tell whether it's a reticulocyte or a more mature red blood cell. And we can filter them, separate them, and do our experiments. So here is a demonstration of this. So you can see the faster ones are older red blood cells. The slower ones are reticulocytes. They're twice as stiff. So now, there is a direct connection between this and the types of malaria. So there are two common forms of malaria that affect hundreds of millions of people every year. Approximately half of the people infected get plasmodium falciparum malaria, half get plasmodium vivax malaria. For example, in places in Thailand, most of the mortality is due to plasmodium falciparum, um, but plasmodium vivax is also very prevalent in that part of the world. So plasmodium vivax is primarily uh, uh, the parasite targets reticulocytes, whereas in falciparum it targets any red blood cell. So by separating reticulocyte with any red blood cell, we can tell which form of malaria it is very quickly, which is not that easy to do. The other advantage is plasmodium vivax cannot be cultured in vitro. You have to take blood from a malaria patient and, and do this. That's why we cannot do stiffness measurements in our lab on plasmodium vivax that easily. So now let me move to how do, how do we go from the cell to cell population level to the organ level. To do this correctly, we need 3D computational tools. And we also need to do experiments on real human organs. So how do we do this? So we have collaborations with Institute Pasteur in Paris. And uh, let me describe one particular experiment. But before I go to that, we need computational tools to model this. If you use continuum standard fluid mechanics models, Navier-Stokes equation, then those kinds of models, they are too coarse. They will not inform us at the cell level. If you use, on the other hand, molecular dynamics, it's too refined, and you cannot, you cannot model large populations of cells. So we use a technique called dissipative particle dynamics, which is a coarse grain model where you take collections of cells or collections of particles and then you discretize them and then you use uh, different forces uh, to calculate um, the different behavior responses. And we've done it for red blood cells, we've done it for white cells, we've done it for platelet cytoadherence and so forth. So I won't go into the details of the DPD model other than to mention a couple of things. This is in collaboration with Professor George Karniadakis at Brown University He's in the applied math department and uh, some of his students and, uh, and my group. And this work is relatively recent. It was just published this year. And here is an example of the kinds of things we, you can do with these kinds of three-dimensional computational models for large cell populations. This is experimental work from University of Washington in Seattle done a few years ago with red blood cells and malaria parasites in vitro using microfluidic channels on how they flow through. So let me first show you the real lab experiment. You can also see the rolling of the red blood cells on, those, on the walls, just like white cells roll. Uh, um. 
Now, here is the 3D model using the dissipative particle dynamic simulation. So we can, it's only limited by computing power at this point. So these are systematically validated with quantitative for, uh, pressure velocity curves from microfluidic experiments. And, and then using that, you calibrate these models. And then for clarity, we just show the red blood cells. We've taken platelets and white cells and plasma out of the blood. Um, so now, how do we link it to organ function? So the human spleen, which is somewhere here, has the job of taking out abnormalities in the red blood cell. So the spleen has the white pulp and the red pulp. So if the red blood cell has a parasite in it, the, the, the spleen has the job of taking it out. But if the, red, if the invaded uh, cell does a, cannot get to the spleen, the spleen cannot do the job. So there is a disease called spherocytosis, which affects one in 5,000 people of Scandinavian origin. So if you're genetically predisposed to spherocytosis, your red blood cell is not a discocyte shape, it's a spherical shape. A sphere cannot, a, a eight micron sphere cannot squeeze through a two micron tube. Right? So when somebody has severe form of spherocytosis, their spleen will go crazy. So one of the clinical interventions for people with spherocytosis is splenectomy, remove the spleen. You can live without a spleen. And uh, so it's very important to understand the spleen function, but the physics and the mechanics of the spleen is not well understood. So my collaborators at Institute Pasteur, especially Dr. Pierre Buffet, who is both a scientist and a clinician, what they do is the two kinds of experiments. So they created a bead experiment, in vitro experiment, where they have metal beads that have a large and small diameter to mi mimic the human spleen. They calibrated by sending human blood and also infected blood through this. And then they monitored the real function of the human spleen ex vivo outside the body. And then they tried to calibrate it. So when they do the experiment, one thing they needed was 3D computational simulations, which we provided using the DPD model. And that's what you see here. This is how the red blood cell goes through their bead experiment. So we model their bead experiments first. Then what they do is when somebody has pancreatic cancer in the Paris area, some of the pancreatic cancer patients also need splenectomy. When they remove the spleen, the spleen is actually well-functioning spleen for the cancer patients. So the doctors there have access to the human spleen outside the human body. Now you can do ex vivo experiments. You can infect the blood with malaria parasites because it's outside the body and do the experiment. So to now in bring engineering to the medical experiments on the human spleen, what we do is we bring our quantitative modeling and our bead experiments and our microfluidic experiments to their spleen experiment, human, real human spleen experiment, and then we link them. So this is their human uh, isolated perfused human spleen system outside the human body. And so we create these 3D models so that they can calculate pressure differential and things like this. So this is also very beneficial. Now here is an example of single cell experiments, cell population experiments, 3D computational models informing a human organ system and using experimentally validated data. So now I'm going to take I've just a couple of more things to go. I'm going to take digress putting my scientist hat on. As a scientist, we have the luxury sometimes say we want to do things just for fun I don't care what the application is but here there is a lot of applications so here is the basic question so nature made the human red blood cell biconcave for a particular reason uh, to increase the surface to volume ratio but you can ask the question why that particular biconcave shape why why not some other shape that also increases the surface to volume ratio why that shape why that diameter and why that particular property of mechanical properties at the molecular level and cell level? Why not something else? And this is, as far as I know, an un unanswered question. So this is what I call shape thermodynamics. And you bring in thermodynamics to probe shape. Shape affects properties. Properties affect function. Function affects disease. So shape affects disease. So if we can modulate shape through chemistry, we can have an intervention, potentially, or vice versa. So that's, that's the goal. So here I'm going to demonstrate a particular experiment. So we asked the question, why did nature make the cell biconcave? So our, I want to warn you that this comp 
computational simulation using molecular dynamics, it's not unique. It's one of many different paths to, we can take to answer the question. But nevertheless, it's very informative. So this is what we do. We know that the red blood cell shape is biconcave. So just for fun, we take a whole red blood cell of a spherical shape of the same surface area as a regular healthy human red blood cell. But the same surface area has 40% more volume in its spherical than its biconcave. So we have the right area, but the wrong volume. Okay? So we'll start with that. Then we take the surface, we discretize it into all the spectral molecules that are in the human red blood cell. There are about 80,000 molecules. We can put all the molecules in there. It's approximately triangular shape. That's what you see here. Then we put in defects. So we take a human red blood cell spectrum, look at it in the, under the atomic force microscope. We know where the defects are. So in the computational model, we create the defects. And then we randomize the defects. So this is where we start. Then we start to give free energy penalty. We say, what is the free energy penalty to stretch a molecule? What is the free energy penalty to have a network of triangles? What is the free energy penalty associated with curvature? We add up, because it's computational, we add up all the free energy penalties. And then at every step, numerical step, we minimize the free energy and ask the question, what is the right shape? So how do we do this? So we start with this. This is the initial configuration, right surface area, wrong volume, but the right molecular architecture, right defect distribution. Then we start putting the free energy penalty. Then we keep the surface area constant, reduce the volume by 40%. Now both the surface area and volume are the right, right values. Then ask the question, what is the equilibrium shape based on free energy minimization? And that's shown in the next slide. And you'll see in a minute how the shape evolves, purely by energy minimization. Not only that, because we are doing it computationally, we know the persistence length of these molecules, so we can actually calculate the bending modulus. We know the shear modulus, we know the curvature, so you can take the bending modulus to shear modulus ratio. It turns out that if the bending modulus to shear modulus ratio is below a critical value, you will never get the shape. It's above a critical value, it's always get, you always get the shape. So nature made this for a particular reason, and that's why the shear modulus of a human red blood cell, healthy human red blood cell, for all of us, is between 4 and 10 micronewtons per meter. There is a reason for it, and this is one explanation for the reason, just for the fun of it. And uh, now you can do that for other shapes as well. So now I'm going to finish with the last issue. So I've talked about uh, different aspects of bringing different disciplines to probe human malaria. Um, the same issues also apply. Uh, I, in the interest of time, I'm not going to show, show it, but I'll just mention it. We can also apply this to other diseases. So for example, we know that the sickle cell disease preferably targets people of African origin. And in fact, sickle cell disease started as nature's way of targeting, uh, providing a, some partial immunity to malaria uh, in Africa. And uh, this, this people with a sickle cell trait, it happens because of one genetic mutation in the sixth position of the amino acid. When valine is substituted by glutamic acid, you get the sickle cell trait. So in the deoxygenated state, rather than take, having globular molecules, you have fibrous shape that causes the characteristic sickle shape. So some of the things we have recently done, we have an NIH grant the last few years. What we looked at was um, trying to see if we can sickle in vitro in the lab in the deoxygenated state and can we do it reversibly. So when you add oxygen, it goes back to its original shape. You can easily do that. Now trying to understand treatments like hydroxyurea and so forth uh, is, is the next step. We're also looking at a parallel program on things like spherocytosis and ellipto Asian elliptocytosis, et cetera, connection between shape, properties, function, and disease state. The last uh, couple of slides that I want to show you is actually some work we started in collaboration with um, a group in uh, Germany with um, uh, Professor Joachim Spartz and his collaborators in, uh, at that time at University of Wilm in, in Heidelberg, and, and that group showed that um, 
for certain types of cancer, especially cancers that metastasize, um, deformability can play a role. The role that it plays is just the opposite of what we find in the case of malaria. Take pancreatic cancer as an example. In the case of pancreatic cancer, there are certain naturally occurring chemicals, bio, bioactive lipids in the human body that can target cancer cells that can cause nu around the nucleus in the perinuclear region cytoskeletal re reorganization which makes the cell less stiff or more deformable which is the opposite of what I showed you for malaria. A more deformable cell can possibly more easily go through size limiting pores in the body and maybe this is one mechanism for cancer cells to metastasize, cancer to metastasize and spread to other parts of the body. It was a very controversial topic, but there have been since been a number of papers that are published, not only in our joint work with that group, but also other groups from Texas and other places in Germany, and also more recently uh, at UCLA Medical School. So this is a topic also of growing interest, but I want to leave you with one particular um, uh, example from work done at UC Berkeley and UC San Francisco Medical School. And this is with respect to leukemia and chemotherapy. So this was a paper that was published uh, three years ago in, in the journal Blood. More, as you know, most leukemia patients need to get chemotherapy. Even though chemotherapy regimen have improved significantly over the last uh, few decades, there is one detrimental cons consequence of chemotherapy. And that's a disease called leukostasis. Leukostasis in some cases can be a life-threatening disease. And some examples show that even though we have improved chemotherapy significantly, the negative consequence of chemotherapy from leukostasis has not changed substantially in the last few decades. And one of the key factors affecting this is mechanical obstruction. So the chemotherapy is intended to kill cancer cells and a whole bunch of other cells as well. But one consequence of killing cells is that they become very stiff. So when they become very stiff, they can obstruct, they can be mechanical obstructors. What is the consequence of that? It is suspected that leukostasis is a consequence of that. So the Berkeley and San Francisco group did the following experiments. So they did experiments on hum human leukemia samples for both types of leukemia, lymphoid leukemia and myeloid leukemia. Uh, and then they measured stiffness for these samples by exposing the cancer cells to the same chemotherapy regimen that's given to patients in the same dosage, in controlled dose. And what you can see here is that the beige color is cancer cell, the red color is cancer cell treated with chemotherapy drugs. So when you kill the cancer cell, the stiffness increases by a factor of 30. And that's the same thing for lymphoid as well as myeloid leukemia. Then they did a very clever experiment. So they added, so if the cell becomes stiff, can we modulate mechanical response by adding to the chemotherapy regimen an actin, uh, depolymerize, uh, actin polymerization agent that prevents the polymerization process. So nothing has changed except there is an additive now. And then you do the same chemotherapy treatment. And what they show is you measure the stiffness as a function of exposure to chemotherapy in time. The red curve is a normal chemotherapy regimen going over about three hours. You take samples periodically and you do mechanical measurements. The blue one is when you add this agent 45 minutes into the chemotherapy treatment. The green curve is you add it at time zero. So what they found was that you completely suppress the stiffening effect when you add this agent. So this is only one experiment, and this may not be ready for prime time, but nevertheless what it shows is that there is a potential, and it's only a potential, this is by no means proven by one study, that you can take existing treatments and modulate them in such a way through chemistry and through, through pharma pharmaceutical processes so that you can get the beneficial effect of the drug without the detrimental effect of the drug. This is one example of that. Now for therapeutics, so we talked about diagnostics, fundamental studies, this is now therapeutics. A similar study was done at UCLA Medical School last year where they took pleural effusions, fluids from the lung region, and then using mechanical measurements in the UCLA hospital, try to see if you can diagnose different types of cancer 
in addition to traditional techniques. It is not that these techniques will replace conventional techniques, but in some of the conventional techniques the early stage detection probability is 65 percent or less. So, by adding one more tool can you improve the early detection probability. So, they did blind experiments on 14 suspected cancer patients. It would turn out that 7 of them have cancer, 7 do not and they correctly predicted the 7 that have cancer and the other 7 that did not have cancer using this technique. The instrument costs about $100,000 to put it in a cancer ward is not a big expense. So, but still it is not ready for prime time it is very experimental it is again one study, but again there is an opportunity. So, this is one of the other advantages of disciplines merging engineering and other disciplines coming into contact in this case with cancer therapy. This is my rendition in the this is the group Sharon Cross and her co-workers at UCLA. Um, I wrote a, a, a piece on their paper in the same issue of nature um, and this is my rendition of their work on uh, how, the, how the technique was used in, in comparison to uh, current techniques. So, let me conclude with a few observations. Even though this we are still in the infancy of going from cell level diagnostic tools, I hopefully I have convinced you that there are so many tools and techniques available in so many different disciplines that hitherto have not come together and putting them together not just at the organ and the tissue level, but also at the cell and molecular level we have significant opportunities to make advance even in diseases as exotic as malaria, which is not really an engineer's uh, field of uh, uh, pursuit usually. Um, so, I think that is one opportunity. The second opportunity I find is that by bringing biology into engineering, we ask very different kinds of questions for computational modeling that we do not otherwise ask. In fact, these are much more complex experiments to do, much more complex computations to do compared to what we were used to doing and engineering benefits by having uh, biology in, uh, in a very significant way. And there is significant opportunity to create new software, new tools uh, to do this. Latest advances in different fields can inform us at the intersections we can create new fields and again there is an opportunity to do that. Potentially again speaking for as, as uh, from the National Science Foundation we are interested more in fundamental scientific discoveries. Uh, we are not interested it is not our charter to study human diseases the same way NIH does, but nevertheless fundamental understanding can be significantly improved. Diagnostic capabilities and I gave several examples and possibly novel, th novel therapeutics and drug efficacy assays. So, I will stop with that and I would like to acknowledge all of this work was funded through NIH and a variety of other mechanisms. So, my work here is not funded by NSF <laughs> <laughs> and I do not receive any funding from this group now since I started at NSF. So, there is absolutely no conflict of interest. So, everything I have described to you was before I joined NSF and some of the publications are just starting to come out. And uh, uh, I would like to acknowledge my uh, uh, students and postdocs. It is very carefully color coded especially for people in this institute. I know you are highly multidisciplinary. So, here we have the white color is all people with engineering background. This color are people with science background mainly biology or parasitology and so forth. The underlined ones are medical doctors. This color is our collaborators in Asia mainly in Singapore. This is my institute pastor collaborators in Paris in France. Uh, we have many others that I have not included here for the results that I showed you. So, thank you very much.
Hey, similar approach to you have to applying interdisciplinary aspects to the work. Yeah. Um, I started this uh, when I already had my tenure. I, I was actually a department head when I started this work. And uh, uh, the challenge for me was whether I would get tenure if I did interdisciplinary work or not. But the biggest challenge for me at that time was whether I, whether I will make a complete fool of myself by going into a field that I knew very little about at that time. And also, it's very comforting to work in a field where I know the community, where I'm well known, and where I have the connections for funding agencies and things like this, going into a completely different field. And especially, I ask the question, why should a medical doctor take me seriously, especially when I talk about malaria as an engineer? But what is remarkable is, I think, it, thanks to um, the creation and evolution of bioengineering departments across the country, and your department is a, is a leading department in that, in that regard, is that the, 20 years ago, it would have been much more difficult. And it was very clear that the language that I spoke to the parasitology community, there was a big impedance mismatch in the beginning. And there's probably still some impedance mismatch. Uh, but people understand. I think there is a much greater realization that uh, communities have much to offer when they work together. To re for your specific question, it's not easy to, to do a PhD in one field and then drastically change discipline when you start as an assistant professor somewhere else. I can tell you, and this is very much on our minds, so at NSF uh, in the last year since I got there, we, we started a conversation on, in two, three different directions. The first one is uh, how do we make it easier internally so that um, people in one directorate are able to identify good ideas from coming from a different field. And that's, as you know, like just established departments and universities, it's not often that easy. The second thing is in 2012, which, is, which starts in October next month, we'll be uh, launching a new program uh, called INSPIRE. INSPIRE stands for Integrative NSF Support Promoting Interdisciplinary Science and Engineering. The purpose of the INSPIRE program is to exactly identify those kinds of ideas that will fall through the disciplinary cracks. Uh, and, and if we can do that, I think it will be very good. So there are a number of other ideas that are there, but those are two examples. So uh, it's a very good question. In fact, the question, I don't know if you heard in the back, the question was how do we go from uh, more quantitative understanding to, to uh, how it can be implemented in hospitals and so forth. Um, that's the direction. That's exactly what we want to do. So the whole microfluidics work that I talked about, portable devices, that's exactly in that regard. But we're not there yet because we don't have enough background information to claim that these things work to a level that you know you actually tried on a patient there's no way we are there yet uh, we are quite a bit far off from there a lot of the technology exists but still a lot of the interactions are not solved here for example i did not say anything about chemistry the right chemistry so i i, I can have a microfluidic channel i can have a cell going through but i don't have the right chemistry i don't have endothelial cells there what kind of interactions do we have i did not show a lot of information that we are working on right now. For example, we are targeting specific molecules like CD36. What is the interaction of CD36 uh, from the infected red blood cells to the endothelial cells? Um, so going one by one, cytoadherence studies, I did not show any data. We have a lot of data on cytoadherence. But we started in parallel with computational models, whole blood, mainly to go in the direction that you are pointing to. So we are coming there, and a lot of groups have now started to work. When we started about six years ago, there were only one or two groups in the world. Now there are many, many groups working on this, which is very good, because now we can coordinate data and experiments with other groups. And uh, so this is where we are. But I think it'll take quite a bit of time. And even in the examples that I showed for cancer, there are a lot of groups now starting to work in that area with these kinds of approaches. So five years from now, 10 years from now, I think I'm positive that we'll be much farther along than where we are right now. So we have one last question before we go to lunch. My question uh, relates to the changing uh, the fees are not up very quickly. Uh, and that fees is the main property. What impact does that have changing the information or the parasite basically is that is that by itself a reason or there are any more uh, 
So, so the parasite replication actually happens during the course of the full 48 hour cycle. The RISA is only in the first 24 hours. So in the second half of the 24 hour cycle, you not only have change in deformability, you also have histidine rich proteins that play a role. So we have a separate study that actually has looked at histidine rich proteins. There is a protein called CARP, which stands for knob assisted histidine rich protein. And we have found ways to knock out some of these proteins. But still, people in the genetics community have not figured out a way to systematically knock out and knock in, so the experiments are not conclusive. So we have only, we have conclusively shown the effect of RISA on stiffening. We have conclusively shown the effect of RISA on febrile temperature. But we have not conclusively shown yet the effect of RISA in conjunction with histidine-rich proteins in replication and, and cytoadherence and so forth. So that, yet, that's yet to be done. Okay, we have Dr. Suresh on a pretty tight schedule. So let's let the uh, conversation continue over lunch. Um, before we do that, though, I want to give you a small token of our appreciation. I hope the NSF conflict of interest rules allow you to accept this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.